So welcome everyone, if, uh, if you're joining us. Um, I'm here with a senior fisheries biologist, Cameron Sinclair, and um, he's with the Department of Environment for the last several years um, working on fish things. And he's graciously offered us uh, some of his time on a Wednesday night uh, to support the wildlife feeding program and sharing information about different species we have in the Yukon. Um, and specifically tonight, we're, he's going to talk about the life history of Arctic grayling and some of the research that's going on in the Yukon so that we can better understand their populations. So um, this, this presentation is being recorded and we're going to post it on YouTube afterwards if, um, if people want to watch it later. And if you have any questions or comments, things you'd like to know more, please do add them into the chat and uh, I'll be following along and uh, writing them down so that we can follow up at the end. If we get interrupted for, you know, the internet goblins are working or anything like that, you'll have to leave that Zoom or that Facebook Live event and then a fresh one will be loaded up. So exit that video and then just stay on the wildlife viewing page and we'll, we'll just start a new Zoom meeting and fire it out there. So um, if that happens, which sometimes it does, that's where we'll be. Um, so I think we'll just get ready to get going. Um, if you wanna take it away, Cameron and, and uh, show us uh, what you know about some grayling. Great, thanks, Harry. Uh, we do work on fish things, uh, mostly on lake trout, uh, but I'm gonna show um, a presentation here about Arctic grayling, its life history, and um, a couple of projects we're doing in the Yukon, sort of the status of, of grayling in the Yukon. So I'll get Carrie to make sure you can see that as we get going. You should be able to see the screen there, Carrie. Give me a thumbs up or a thumbs yes, down. Yes, I, I can up. see it. I'm just waiting for it to go live on the Facebook page just to make sure everything's all good. But I can see it, right. so I'm assuming it's going to get there in a couple seconds. Well, if you can see it, me and you will talk about grailing and people can can chime in. Uh, all right, my, like Carrie said, my name is Cameron Sinclair. I'm the senior fisheries biologist for the department. And uh, tonight's talk is going to talk um, a bit about the life cycle of Arctic grailing. Uh, and there's our uh, way if you guys have any questions or can't get through, it's fisheries at yukon.ca to, to get a hold of us and one of our team will get that to you for sure. Um, and we're also going to talk about grayling in the Yukon, uh, the status of the populations that we know about, followed by um, sort of a quick review of what's going on as far as on the research side for, for Arctic grayling in the Yukon, what projects are, are taking some of our our time um, to, to spend uh, discussing these guys or researching them. All right, so uh, if you're unaware, this is a Arctic grayling. Um, like the thing says there, it is a 100% accurate real life image. <laughs> they have googly um, eyes like that. That's They, they that's have a... exact googly eyes yeah. like that. And no mouth. Um, mm -hmm. and, and no mouth for feeding. Uh, but primarily, they have this big, sail-like dorsal fin that's uh, iridescent red, uh, aqua, or uh, purple in color. And this is this is the key feature that people um, want to see when they're when they're catching grayling. It draws people to to fish for grayling in the first place. It is very unique in the freshwater fishery world to have a dorsal fin that big um, and it's, it's what sets these guys apart from from any other, any other fish and then they have some dark spots or, or freckles um, along sort of that, that front area just below the dorsal fin and the rest is very similarly colored uh, to this if um, Carrie spends more time uh, drawing her pictures will eventually end up looking like this this is uh, very famous uh, fisheries artist, and yes, that is a uh, profession for, for some. Uh, Joseph uh, Tomilleri, I believe is his name. Wait, that's uh, a drawing? That's not a picture? Yes, that is a, that is a drawing. Oh, and, um, I, that is. There are some other really good artists out there. This is, this is one, so you'll get there eventually. Yeah, I'll work um, on it. <laughs> whoever drew that last one. Uh, so let's talk about life cycle <laughs> um, from spawning uh, all the way through overwintering. It's hard to figure out like where to start on a life cycle, whether the chicken came before the egg or the grayling came before the egg. So we'll start on this sort of thing. Um, so first of all, we'll talk about uh, spawning, uh, where, where they spawn, when they spawn. We're going to talk about uh, hatching, how long the eggs take to hatch, uh, and where they go. We're going to talk about juveniles. So these are the young guys and how to get them off. Um, 
I had a I had a joke in there and lost it, but how to get them off Fortnite and, and get out there. And then we'll talk about the adults. Um, this is predominantly the people, the, the sort of the age category that people are angling for, and then where they spend their time uh, during the winter. So spawning. Uh, this is actually the picture in the background was the United States for or Fish and Wildlife Service is a, is a good representation of what it looks like when, when grayling are migrating and spawning. Uh, so when, when do grayling spawn? When is the spawning time frame? We all know the, the salmon runs are mostly in the fall or lake trout are in the fall. Uh, springtime is the spawning time for Arctic grayling. Uh, springtime for them is about late April through early June, really it's right when that ice is coming off the water. Um, and they commence their migration from their overwintering areas uh, when the water temperature starts getting warmer. Uh, so normally this keys in, let's say like that, two, three, four degrees Celsius will key them in to get into their spawning um, range. And they can travel a fair distance, although we think of grayling just being in a tiny little stream most of the time, uh, or maybe in a lake. Uh, there's been studies uh, in North America that actually show that these guys have um, traveled over up to 70 kilometers uh, to get to their spawning area. So it's not a big, not a big salmon run, um, but they do they do travel quite a bit. And then um, they do spawn again. It's, it's temperature based, so this normally happens around eight to fourteen uh, degrees Celsius in these um, in their in their spawning areas. We'll, we'll show you where as well. Uh, and that happens when the grayling are reach what we call age of maturity, which is between three and six. It, it varies per um, each po population and individual, but it's roughly that sort of three to six year um, age gap. Now, where do these guys spawn? Uh, they spawn in small, cold, clear streams with a little bit of gravel bottom substrate. Uh, and this is your most people here, if they've ever angled for grayling, uh, a lot of people go out in the springtime because that is when they spawn. Uh, that's when they're, they're congregated um, and you'll, you're not digging holes ice fishing for them. You're going to that right when the, the ice comes off. Um, and it's probably one of the first fish that people catch. Uh, in the Yukon that aren't tours coming up here. We've had long winters and things are starting to open up and you go fishing and there happens to be grayling there uh, and they're there because they, they are spawning. When they do spawn, it is different than say a salmon that would sort of shake their body and build what we call a red, which is like a little nest for their eggs. Essentially the um, males, either one or two will go beside the female They'll shake a little bit and release their eggs and milt, and the eggs will just sort of settle wherever into the gravel uh, substrate below. So there's no visible nesting behavior um, of Arctic grayling. And they can put down uh, between 1,500 and 30,000 eggs. Oh, sorry, I thought I had a question there. Right um, they can actually, I did, couldn't find a good picture of it, but that dorsal fin, when they are spawning, will actually wrap around the female uh, sometimes. And there's, uh, I think there's some videos on the internet. Just Google Arctic grayling spawning and, and you'll be able to see it. It's pretty neat. So after they spawn, uh, they hatch. And there's a little, tiny little picture of some tiny grayling. Actually, about the picture is about the same size, but the grayling are tiny. Um, so when do they hatch? Grayling hatch very quickly compared to uh, other fish. Um, so for example, in the Yukon, we have whitefish that can take months to hatch. Uh, grayling hatch in about two to three weeks after spawning or uh, squiggly line approximately 18 days. So it's in that rough time frame where they've um, spawned and then these juveniles are hatching. Right when they hatch, they get out of there. They look for places for protection. Um, so they go to undercut banks uh, and slow moving water to, to find some spots. So they're not just blown out by the small, uh, sort of the velocity of the creek, taking them back to whatever lake system that the creek's going to. They're looking for some small space where they can be protected and they can swim in. Clearly these guys have little tiny fins. They don't have a lot of swimming force. They need some place to sort of chill out and eat and grill. And then they end up growing into uh, whiny, complainy juveniles. Uh, they live very similarly in the same location as where the, the hatchlings are, or the, uh, the fry is what they're called. 
And they continue to live in these calm waters, undercut banks, and uh, some pools. So again, all of Calm waters, undercut banks, pools, they have the same characteristic of having slow water and not a lot of force that's gonna, that they're going to have to fight against uh, to swim and find their food. And again, they're in small streams where they're very close to their, their hatching and spawning areas. When they're juveniles, they don't just uh, take off and, and leave. They, they normally hang around the, the same spot where they're hatched. Uh, what do the uh, juveniles eat? They uh, predominantly eat uh, zooplankton, uh, they eat aquatic insects, they eat uh, some terrestrial insects, uh, so mayflies, stoneflies, caddisflies. Um, they're fairly voracious eaters, they even get uh, hungrier when they're adults and they grow really quickly because their diet is so varied, it's not just keyed on one thing. Um, so they can grow up to uh, up to 100 plus millimeters by the end of the summer, which is fairly large for a, a juvenile fish only within a couple months. And then they become adults. Uh, so when they're adults, where, where do they live? Well, they migrate out of the, um, uh, the spawning areas into their summer, feed, summer feeding areas. And this is normally those larger rivers. So if they're in a tiny stream where they spawn, they're gonna go down into a, a higher order of stream or into lakes. Um, this is kind of why we, when we're angling for grayling, we catch them in small streams, we catch them in big streams, we catch them in rivers, we catch them in lakes. Uh, we see them all over the place because their habitat is all over the place. Um, Again, they migrate downstream from the spawning area, so they're not gonna go forward up to, up to smaller creeks. And uh, essentially the migration for adults into those spots occurs uh, post-spawning. So once they spawn, they don't really hang out there that long. Um, they don't die off after they spawn, uh, like um, salmon. Uh, they can spawn several times within their lifetime, uh, and they move back into those uh, sort of summer feeding areas. What do the adults eat? Uh, well, pretty much everything. If, if it moves, if it's in the water, if they can fit it in their mouth, they eat it. They eat insects, they eat black flies. Um, thank you, Grayling, for eating black flies. They eat mayflies, caddisflies. They'll actually eat smaller fish as well. Um, there's reports, I believe, in Alaska of them eating shrews that happen to be in the water. Um, so you can see that these guys grow fairly quickly, um, although they're not as large of a species as, as lake trout are or pike, they're, they're actually quite aggressive in, in what they, they eat. And if it goes by them, they're going to put it in their mouths, which allows them to grow fairly large um, in that sort of first year or two. Uh, the adult average size, well, this varies, uh, an average size is about uh, 300 uh, millimeters, and there's uh, some good metric jokes for you if you want them in difference. I didn't have nautical miles in there. I was trying to keep my comedy related to metric. Uh, overwintering. So now they're adults, now they spawn, they're hatched. Where, where do they spend their winters? Um, they migrate uh, to areas essentially that support what we call overwintering habitat. And that is deep pools, uh, larger lakes, and larger streams. And the reason for that is that they need flowing water. They, they don't need to be frozen solid. Uh, so they need uh, space deep enough for them to move around and they need oxygen content. Uh, and we measure oxygen content as dissolved oxygen. Uh, and for fish, it's roughly about greater than five milligrams per liter. Um, and most Yukon lakes will have more than that. Some deep lakes will actually uh, not have enough oxygen to support uh, fish because it needs that sort of rotating uh, amount of water. And uh, so like wind is giving it uh, wave, wave action is the word I'm trying to look for. But they need uh, some place that has enough oxygen and enough space for them. They don't eat a lot in the wintertime. They're less active. Um, if you've ever gone ice fishing, you're not gonna catch as much grayling as you would in the spring and summertime while you still may catch some, but they're less active uh, feeders um, throughout the wintertime. So now that we've gone over these little guys from the time that they're tiny children to adults uh, having tiny children, what are grayling or how are grayling doing in the Yukon? Um, sort of what's the, the population status of grayling? 
Um, and this is uh, pretty important because if anyone can name, I'll give a, a minute here in the comments or a couple of seconds for the first person to name the top three uh, most sought after freshwater fish. This is for recreational anglers. Um, okay. I'm watching, I'm watching. So the top three, so recreational anglers, what are the top three fish that they're looking for? Yeah, so um, Cameron McAngler, myself, if I'm going out there, um, what are the top three fish? Like it's a bad sentence, what are the top three fish that get fished in the, so what, okay. what are anglers looking for? So I'm or the, one of the most popular would be another uh, way to say that probably. I'm waiting for the, the comments. If, uh, if folks have any thoughts, throw it in the comments thread. I, oh, okay. We have, we have someone who might know what he's talking about. He is a smart man. <laughs> um, um, okay, we have a grayling, lake trout, and northern pike as a three. Um, we have another guess on lake trout. Someone else who probably knows what she's talking about. I see some familiar names here. Am, am I on Facebook at the same time? Uh, <laughs> Are you guessing? <laughs> it's a plant. So, yeah, you found my alter ego on Facebook. So number one is Arctic Green. Um, so whoever guessed that as number one, uh, you're okay. still in the running for the prize that I'm sure Carrie has. Um, oh, um, I have this highlighter right here on my desk. So uh, one of the reasons is they're, they're easy to catch. You don't need a lot of gear um, to angle for Arctic grayling. You go to any... Um, fish any store that's selling lures and a small little lure you're going to catch arctic grayling which makes it good because you don't need a big boat uh, you don't need a whole bunch of equipment so you can you can walk there a lot of the times you don't need waders so it's an easy way to get in which is a, a great also fish for kids to learn how to fish and safely so they're like them. the accessible fish yeah exactly okay. right? um another one other reasons that um they're highly sought after mostly for tourists not um uh say us Yukoners is the word arctic is in it and that's uh, is appealing to people and the dorsal fin like i mentioned before this huge massive sort of sail like dorsal fin is that's the reason i wanted to catch it yeah first grayling um they're they're cool looking right what's well, a total yeah totally cool looking fish um yeah number two is lake trout so whoever said number two is lake trout is still in the running um these are, again, highly sought after popular, popular fish in the Yukon. Most lakes, these are very healthy populations. Um, all of our campgrounds or most of our campgrounds have easy boat access. And a lot of people do have boats um, and they're fun to, fun to fish for and good to eat as well. And then number three is Northern Pike. They okay. are a, uh, again, a fairly minimal gear needed, uh, aggressive predator fun to catch uh fish um number one and number three pretty pretty easy fish for um to teach kids how to fish for sure uh next top three is if anyone this is not as easy but um the yukon's most researched uh, freshwater fish so in other words these are the fish that um the department of environments and uh our small fisheries team spend the most time working on okay so like is this is this, um, this might give it away so you can decide if you want to answer or not, but I like, I would think that the fish that are receiving the most pressure from angling would be some of the questions that we, that we are asking. Does that correlate at all? We'll find out. Oh, see. Okay. Okay. We have a uh, top, top research fish. Lake trout is a guess from, from Ben and um, Arctic Charles Pachot, which I think someone might be tagging someone else in a, oh, salmon, number one is also uh, freshly, So this doesn't count salmon, this is just freshwater fish. Okay, so yeah. um, we don't consider um, Chinook or coho right. salmon freshwater. Right, because that's a Department of Fisheries and Oceans. They are, thing. the difference is uh, they're anadromous fish. Um, they okay. go back out to the ocean. Um, the Department of Environment, we uh, only research and do work on fish that don't go back to the ocean. Okay. Um, and so then we have another guest from Sebastian Jones of Lake Trout and Lingcod. Um, All right, so number one okay. uh, is Lake Trout. And one of the reasons here is uh, we have a long program, actually there's just a report put out, I would put a link in here, but it's 
type yukon.ca slash fishing and I think go to technical reports and lake trout. There's a, a new report there uh, with some updated links of um, about a 10 year plus program that's been um, designed to look at lake trout populations. Um, and these guys see the most sort of regulatory um, changes because they're slow, they're long lived. I could do a multi hour talk on lake trips, but that's not for tonight, but basically they take a long time to recover. So we don't want to get fish to that stage. Uh, the next one probably is Arctic grilling um, because it's such a popular spring fishery uh, and people are, including myself, because uh, I don't uh, do a lot of ice fishing, is you're trying to get out there, winter's been long, things are starting to open up and that just so happens to coincide with, with grayling spawning and they're there. And number three uh, and so far has been burbot because um, there's an active winter, winter fishery. Um, and again, similar to lake trout, they're long-lived, slow-growing uh, species. Another very cool-looking fish. Uh, yes, yes, I think uh, burbot are fantastic. Uh, but then again, uh, refer to my my job title. I probably think <laughs> most of the fish here are <laughs> the fantastic. Small, small bias there. Yeah, slight slight bias. Uh, so how are they doing in the Yukon? Uh, so this map with the multicolors, it, it may be a little bit blurry on the side because I had to blow it up, is the conservation data of burbot in the different provinces and in the states. Um, so the so that sort of darkish blue for Alaska and Manitoba and um, Saskatchewan is their populations are pretty secure. Wait, sorry, I'm um, just going to stop you. You said burbot, but I think are we still talking about grayling? Oh yeah, this is grayling. Oh okay. <laughs> Back to our regularly scheduled program. Yes. Okay. Talking We're talking about, about grayling. grayling. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in the Yukon and Northwest Territories and BC, it is apparently secure. Now these these ratings on the side are are global ratings for um, all species, um, whether they're aquatic, whether they're terrestrial, whether it's grayling or, or grizzly bears, they all have some sort of status on this. And ours is apparently secure, um, essentially because there's not a whole bunch of information. And the information that we do have suggests that they're relatively stable and secure. Uh, what I should have put on here, um, it's hard to find, is actually the, the range of grayling. So you see in Montana, um, uh, place that I used to live and work in is, is critically imperiled, but that is also sort of the southern end of their range. Uh, so there's not going to be a lot of grayling in the lower U.S. Um, there's actually a program in, in Michigan. Um, you can see there it's, uh, it says presumed extirpated. They're actually trying to reintroduce grayling through a, uh, a long hatchery program uh, to get grayling back in there. They're also uh, a little bit in Siberia and uh, they have a cousin in Europe, but Arctic grayling uh, are in Siberia and Mongolia as well. And just a couple of spots, but nearly not as broad spread as um, uh, mostly Canada and the states, uh, being Alaska. So wait a minute. In this map, but in Ontario says it's exotic, but Michigan is trying to reintroduce it. Is it like I'm assuming that the fish don't stop at the the border? Uh, no, they, they have to go through the border check on customs, sure. strict yeah. restrictions. Yeah. Yeah, and this all depends on like um, so. A lot of these ranges are. Um, known um, historic ranges, uh, and we're we're lucky here. We have a lot of traditional knowledge uh, with grayling that have been here for millennia. Uh, I'm not I'm not sure in Ontario's uh, position on that. Okay. All right. So uh, grayling in the Yukon. What are the risks uh, and sort of mitigations to grayling in the Yukon? So we we've known the sort of we talked about their life history. They're fun to catch, easy to catch. Uh, people catch them in the summer, uh, springtime, fall. Uh, what are the risks to these populations? Since we just showed that one slide that says that we're they're secure, but there's we don't have a whole bunch of information and research on them. Uh, the first risk is uh, human pressure. And um, that's not necessarily say stop, stop fishing for grayling. This is with any sort of fish. We're humans, we live with them. Uh, how much we catch them uh, is a risk just like it is to any other species, which is why we exist to 
Well, that's going into another topic of why we exist, but why why we do what we do to, to manage these populations. Because essentially, the more people you have, the more anglers you have. Um, but the difference is we have um, a lot of people, uh, Moon to the Yukon, I believe there was a story maybe a year or two ago of uh, population in the Yukon has maybe increased about 20% in the last 10 years, but it's the same essential population of, of Greenland. Um, and so how do we mitigate some of this is, is through public angler education. And that's the people willing to uh, not watch the latest episodes of The Witcher and tune into a Facebook Live presentation of me rambling about grilling on a Wednesday night. They can watch uh, The, the main... Witcher anytime, but they don't get to talk to you about grilling anytime. That is, that is true. <laughs> Uh, and it's an active spring fishery, um, and uh, springtime is the spawning uh, spawning time. So it's the it's the time that's most active for um, uh, us humans angling for them, and it just that happens to be their sort of most sensitive time as well. Um, so how do we sort of mitigate some of this? Is how we're catching uh, grayling and how we're handling grayling. Um, I'm sure there's information on yukon.ca slash fishing about uh, live release ethics. But the main thing is that we're treating fish um, gently and respectfully. Um, respectfully, what I mean by that is that you're trying to keep the fish wet. So when you're handling it, if it doesn't meet the slot size or you're releasing it, is to not take it out of the water and keep it as wet as long as possible. Um, so here's a couple of pictures that sort of show the examples. So you'll see this a lot on um, Facebook, the platform that we're on, that someone catches a fish and we all have cameras since we all have phones and they take a picture of it. Um, this is actually a picture from Idaho Fishing Game versus a underwater picture of a grayling because um, everyone wants, wants to share their catch and look, I went out and, and, and caught a fish. So for keeping them wet, what we, are trying to get across is keep them underwater like that for, for photos, um, especially since most phones now are turning into cameras that are, are, are waterproof and you get a more natural picture. That fish on the right is breathing the whole time. The fish on the left is struggling because they're in the air. So it's keeping them wet. It's, it's, it's using the right gear um, to limit injury when you do release the fish. Um, so with catch-in, uh, when you're sort of live releasing fish, when you're following the right uh, techniques, and there's a lot of information out there uh, on the best techniques to use, but it's keeping them wet, it's using barbless hooks, uh, rubberized nets, actually, they found that the, the cloth nets will actually, will injure it. Um, when I started this uh, profession in the late 90s, we'd use cotton gloves. Um, that actually started, we, there's some research done that cotton gloves were, were damaging fish. So when you're holding it like that picture on the right, catch the same fish again and have some scarring on that. Um, same, same goes with nets, so it's that rubberized nets. And mostly you'll see a lot of this in any of the uh, dangling uh, deer stores that you're going to is that there's gonna be barbless hooks everywhere. There's going to be rubberized nets everywhere. Um, there are some regulations on barbless hooks in, in some areas on the Yukon. I suggest using barbless hooks throughout the Yukon, just because it, it really limits that. Um, you may have a fish on that you may lose a little bit more, um, but you're going to really uh, limit the injury to the fish and just increase its survival. And then there may be a question, I'm sure in the chat maybe, um, uh, what is the survival rate of a fish that you release? And depending on the techniques, um, it can vary. You can get up to, like we estimate about 85% um, survival. And that sort of takes in the um, angler who has never fished before, uh, that may be doing absolutely everything wrong that may hurt at survival versus the angler that's doing everything right. So they sort of balance them. They do, there's a high uh, survival rate, but we can get that better with using the right gear. The next, next risk is habitat degradation. Um, so what are the risks to grayling habitat? Uh, so just like the risks to um, grayling or pressure, it's, it's us, it's humans again, and human development is, is the first one. And that's uh, put down some plaster mining, road construction, basically any sort of development that is going to uh, change or fragment the habitat. 
it's it's uh, development that get puts in a dewater scenario or has an increase in sediment. And that all sounds like all development is is terrible and bad and we shouldn't do it. There um, is a lot of information and uh, approvals and permits for proponents that are starting projects that they have to be following certain rules and regulations um, to not cause the death or harmful uh, alteration and death and destruction of fish and fish habitat to protect this as much as we can. Um, but there's still lots of roads around the world that you'll see with culverts that aren't, aren't connected and the roadway has done. So humans are doing a lot better in the last 10, 15 years on this. There's still lots of things in the world built by humans more than 10 years ago. So it's that ha habitat fragmentation. So if the grayling can't get to their spawning areas or any fish can't get to their spawning areas, that's, that's, that hurts a lot. And it's the, um, it's the sediment, like I said, grayling are um, spawning and moving into areas of those cold, clear uh, streams. It's that clear thing is important to them. So they can't stand a lot of, uh, would be turbidity beyond the sort of the natural, natural level. Uh, and climate change. Climate change is affecting everything. It's one thing that uh, grayling are probably not going to stop uh, climate change, even though people are uh, concerned about grayling. But it also may cause habitat fragmentation. It may cause erosion of banks that have a lot more sediment. Um, look at the, although it's not grayling specific, we see in Kluwani Park with the diversion of the Slims River. So climate change can, can move rivers. So how do we, how do we mitigate this? I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, sort of regulations. Uh, but one of them is allowing habitat connectivity. So here is a uh, picture of a fairly well designed culvert. This is in the Yukon, I can't remember exactly what road it is. Um, that is allowing ish fish uh, uh, passage. Uh, so it has two culverts. One is for high water. So when you know, that spring fresh head, you're just trying to bump a bunch of water out so it doesn't wash everything away. That's the, that's the dry one. And the other one is sort of year round and the low water. Um, so it's maintaining habitat connectivity and there's actually a fair amount of information out there and research on the angle of what culvert should be to allow fish to get in there. So this one is, I say this one is good-ish because it's that um, little jump on the right, they could still get up there, um, but it's pretty shallow water and a fairly long uh, culvert system to go up. So although that looks good, it probably still struggles with grayling at certain times of the year. Um, we just got to make sure that those times aren't the times of their sort of those key movements. And one of the reasons why this is so important is this is uh, what grayling uh, sort of spawning habitat uh, may look like and does look like uh, in the Yukon. And it can be fragmented by a lot of things. There's a, if you look on the far right side of the screen, I say I have my cursor there, but I don't think you can see it is a beaver dam. You can see it based on sort of the two colors of, of water. There's that really dark um, color of water and then sort of followed by that murky uh, aqua green. Well, my wife probably says I'm colorblind, but the, the lighter color of water. And those are actually um, like railing in the spawning season that you can see hiding underneath the, um, the logs there. So they like really clear water like this. Uh, so you can see how potentially vulnerable they are to predators. Uh, you may have a bird or so there that's really not going to dent it, but you can actually go up to a lot of places in the Yukon and see grayling um, spawning because they spawn in cold, clear, shallow streams. Um, so it's areas like this that need to be protected. Which goes on to cool. Um, What's going on with grayling? What uh, what research is being done uh, in the Yukon? Sort of past and present. I just want to talk about a couple little programs that have been done uh, in the past and in the present. The past being uh, the Lubon grayling. Um, so there's, uh, if everyone here is familiar, raise your hand. Uh, the Lubon River. I don't know if there's hands in Facebook, uh, but it's, uh, it's south of Little Atlan. It's between Little Atlan and Atlan Lake. And there was a collapse of grayling there in the, um, I guess, early to mid 1990s. Um, and essentially they were, they were overfished there. So the, the whole area was shut down for, for several years for them to repopulate. And it took several years to repopulate because like I said before, grayling are spawning at that three to six year age mark. 
So it takes a while for them to have kids and their kids to have kids and their kids to have kids to have a bigger population there. So the department at the time, and I wasn't uh, with the department time this time, this is sort of early 2000s, uh, mid 2000s, we started to look at how this population was uh, uh, doing to get a population estimate through snorkel surveying. Um, although I find snorkel surveying uh, hilarious, it is actually relatively effective and gets a good number. It's not just, well, and it is also exactly sticking your head under the water and counting how many fish are there. Um, but what happens, you can see at the far um, sort of top of that picture, there's a net um, and you block off an area and you swim it a couple of times. You swim it once with your with your partner. One does the right side, one does the left side, and you count how many grayling are there. And then you do it again and you count how many grayling are there. And then you do it again and you count how many grayling are there. And you get an estimate at the end. And then you base that size of area based on the size of habitat you're, you're doing. And it is a very old fisheries um, uh, science technique like extremely old because you're putting your head under the water and counting the counting the fish, but it's surprisingly accurate. Um, and then the so the department did this several times, and then they moved to a fish weir along the Lubach. Um, so similar to say salmon weirs, a fish weir, if you're unfamiliar, is essentially you're blocking off the entire stream except for one or two little choke points. So the fish are like here you have a, a fence uh, that's been made of metal. They're going to swim, hit the fence, try to figure out because they're really trying to get to their spawning habitat. And then, oh, there's a hole right there in the middle through that little box and they get captured in there. And essentially it's like a lobster trap where they can't get back out. And then the uh, fisheries biologist goes in and collects the fish there and will take ages um, or will take um, lengths and weights. Uh, fish die will take ages. Uh, and at that time, they also, there's also a genetic assessment done. Um, it's called a close kin mark recapture. So you're taking a tiny cut of its adipose fin, which is that tiny, tiny little fin near the back, not its actual back, um, back fin at all. And you can determine a lot. You can essentially you take that little uh, piece of fin and you bring it to a lab. This uh, project worked with, I believe, University of Dalhousie. And surprisingly enough, if you get enough adults that you can take that little sample from, and then a couple of weeks after they hatch, you go back and you take um, whole juveniles. Um, so basically you're dip netting in those areas that uh, juveniles are hanging out. So it's those undercut banks and you sample them for genetics. You can determine how interrelated the population is. And by doing that, you can actually tell how many parents and offspring pairs there are, and the end result is a, um, is a population estimate. So this was done with uh, the genetic population estimate, the, um, the weir counting estimate, and the snorkel survey uh, estimates, all to figure out uh, the population of fish in, or sorry, grayling in the Yukon River. And this was done uh, based on uh, temperature. Like I said, grayling or spawn uh, and move into the system based on temperature. And this is a terribly colored graph that took it from another presentation, but I'll show you what it's saying here. So the bars here, the numbers aren't uh, really pertinent, but what you need to know here is the bars at the bottom, uh, the red ones are the number of grayling coming into the Lubuck and the blue line is the temperature. And the dates go from end of April through June. So what you're seeing is the temperature is starting to go up. So it's starting to reach that, that I said that two to four degrees, that's gonna key grayling to come in. Well, that's when a whole bunch of grayling came into the system. And this was, I can't remember the year, but this is just one specific year. It's not that every single year on May 1st, that's when the grayling go, it's, it's all based on uh, stream temperature. And then they died off from there, they got colder and they went back to their, their range. And then another got a little bit warmer and another group came and then actually a further group came later in, later in June. Um, but really keys along temperature, which was uh, very interesting that it, it lined up, well, not very interesting, it, it lined up perfectly with what we were saying. So what were the key findings of this, this whole thing? Uh, I found out that the population size was about only 1,100 individuals. And if people have fished uh, in the Lubbock River, and I'm sure a lot of people on the call probably have, uh, I know I have, it's a beautiful area. 
there seems to be a lot more fish than 1100 fish when you're there. And it's because um, unlike salmon that are going from point A to point B, grayling are going from point A to point B to spawn. Then they're also going back to point A, then they're going back to point B again, and then they're going to travel back to point A and going back to point B again. So in these, in the, the weir survey, they actually caught several fish uh, multiple times. So when you're out fishing at the grayling or at the Lubok for grayling, there's not hundreds and thousands and thousands of fish going through there. It's that same population of about a thousand fish throughout that entire system. And that population estimate, uh, it lined up with the genetic survey, said there's about 1,100, the weir survey said there's about 1,100, and the uh, snorkel survey also said there, there's about 1,100. So all the methods were, were producing the same number. Um, and that is what I just said. So the population dynamics, um, fish were caught multiple times. Uh, and the same genetic population I said within that system. So that system goes from Little Atlan or includes Little Atlan, the Lubok, it also includes Snafu and Tarfu Creeks. So all of those were sampled and going out into Atlan and to see if there are different populations uh, within the tiny creeks and they weren't, they were the same genetic populations. Well, like I said, pretty much all the methods are equally equal to each other. So that wrapped up um, a couple years ago. And since then uh, in the Lubok, we've still been working with the um, Karkaras Tagish First Nation and Karkaras Tagish uh, Renewable Resource Council. We've put up some um, newer signs, uh, I believe last year that sort of talk about uh, this project and to talk about grayling and, and live release because it's such a popular area for um, people that live around Whitehorse. Marsh Lake, uh, Carcross to go to in the springtime. We don't want to see this population collapse. It's small, it's vulnerable. And one thing that we're um, trying to sort of put the word out is don't go there and catch uh, and release fish all day long. Uh, so that's, that's sort of be respectful of its uh, right. capture. Be because you mentioned that, that like, there was a 85% um, live release rate or like 85% um, survived. Yeah, Did I get that number right. Yeah, so like the message is like just because you're live releasing doesn't mean the fish will necessarily survive. So just being respectful yeah, correct. of that. Yeah. So it's it's one area that um, we don't want to see the population collapse because it's such a great area to take families and kids mm -hmm. and teach people about fishing and teach people how to properly live release fish uh, and just to learn about a fish that's not a lake trout or a salmon in the Yukon that doesn't get maybe as much attention because uh, you can visually see them off the bridge um, if you've been down there. Um, so it's just just be sort of mindful of some of these facts when you when you do go fish there. And I'll say don't, it's a beautiful area. No, um, yeah. Very, just, great uh, wildlife viewing opportunity there actually. Yeah, yeah just being respectful of, of the, your practices for sure. Yeah. Uh, so right now you'll see us occasionally, I believe last year, the year before, I think it was the first year of COVID. So one to 13 years ago, um, we did an angular harvest survey uh, there. So we had somebody asking questions and you'll see that a lot across the Yukon as we'll hire a contractor to ask questions about, hey, how long did you fish for? What did you fish for? How much did you catch? And that gives us a good idea of what the actual pressure is on an area. So current research. Um, the current research focuses essentially on those two risks that I mentioned, which is pressure um, and habitat. Uh, so the first project that I'll talk quickly about is, um, this is McKenna Lake and talking about uh, pressure. Um, you can see the lake that goes into, I believe that is uh, Scobie Creek, um, but there's lots of, lots of beaver dams on this creek and there's a really it's only a very small area where Arctic railing can spawn. It's relatively close to a road that you can get to it, uh, but we don't want a lot of pressure exerted on that because it's such a small area. It's like the size of two bedrooms where the where, where the grayling are going. So the population is uh, extremely vulnerable at this time of year. So what we're trying to do is determine that current pressure on the population. So yeah, it's a small, vulnerable population, but is anybody out there fishing for it? Um, and how much time are they fishing and what are they actually catching? So we're going to try to find figure out that this year, um, along with uh, the use of spawning habitat. How much is there? Is there other places on the lake um, that have other outflows like this that they'd like to spawn in? 
Uh, grayling predominantly do not spawn in lakes, but they'll be uh, in a river or a creek system like this. Um, and assess the impacts of beaver dam. So this gets connected to the Yard River in BC. Um, so what's the impact on all these beaver dams? So we had our wildlife biologist who's doing the talk next week, uh, Tom, whose talk is not nearly as interesting as mine. Um, oh, can you guys see that? My screen just went a little blurry. Yeah, no, we're all good. Mm -hmm. While well, you were you were busy telling everyone that Tom's talk is going to be boring, but it's got pikas in it, which is like pike only not, and so they're pretty cute. Let me just I just got to disconnect my monitor and then connect it back. So give me a second. Yeah, but meanwhile, yeah, Tom's talk will be very good. <laughs> Sorry, what was that? Talk really. <laughs> talk will be very good, but it's not it's not grilling. No, it won't be about grilling. Technical, technical difficulties. Okay, we'll start this again. Do do bear with me and my um but so build. as you're doing that, Tom's is Tom looking at um the beaver activity in that system? Well you'll be looking at the Yeah, grilling. you guys should hopefully see the uh the screen again now. It's starting. There it is. All right. So yeah, so uh, he looked at um, beaver habitat and beaver dams last uh, last fall. So we're going back to see um, sort of grayling on either side of the beaver dams, and then we're going to uh, do some public education uh, there as well to talk about essentially exactly what we've talked about tonight is that sensitivity of grayling in the springtime, especially if it's a really really small area. Um, we don't want that. Um, area extirpated with grayling. And our, our project partners on this would be the, the Daily Lieutenant Council and uh, Lower Post. So if you're out there this year, which who knows if uh, a lot of people are or aren't, what you'll see is a uh, clearer picture of this, because I realize this is probably quite blurry on your screen and you probably might be able not be able to read it. But it's a sign that talks about um, the, the current knowledge in the system, what we're the project that we're doing um, and how you can avoid um, and how you can help the project essentially it's, it's providing information to us when we're there it's reducing handling time using verbless hooks um, everything that uh, I'd mentioned and we're also going to be doing some assessments on the population there sometime this spring I'm going to say sometime this spring that's really around the spawning time uh, so we're going to try to figure out as uh, good as we can, how many uh, grayling are using that spawning area while also knowing that it is so small and vulnerable, not disrupting um, their ability to get in and out. Because unlike uh, the loop block, which is a bigger system, you could put a big weir or a big fence up there, stop them at the door as they go into this huge area. Um, if we did that there, it's only like 100, 100 meters of area. So it's trying to get that information without, without blocking the creek and preventing them from spawning. So that's, uh, that's one project that we're working on. And the second one is uh, the risk dealing with uh, habitat. Um, this one is located in Granite Creek, so up by Mayo, uh, the far end of Mayo Lake. Um, so there's no, no road access there, um, but it is an area that has been affected, or not being affected, but is actively uh, plaster mined. Um, so we're trying to figure out the long term effects to grayling habitat and population dynamics. Uh, when there's plaster mining happening and also remediation after plaster mining. Um, so a uh, brief aside on that, the plaster mining regime in the Yukon and the, the rating of what is a uh, highly sensitive creek uh, versus a low sensitive creek is currently based on Chinook salmon as a keystone species in the Yukon and what, what their needs are. Um, but there's still lots of areas that um, salmon wouldn't get to uh, or wouldn't be an important area for salmon. So maybe rated lower, but it'd be really important for uh, another freshwater species. Um, so that works really, really well in spots um, using salmon and like such as Dawson, where, where salmon would be having their run. Not as much when you're more inland and away from the, the main Yukon River stem. Uh, so we're trying to figure out what's, what happens with the habitat, what happens when they remediate it. Um, is there any impact on the grayling uh, during uh, active mining? Do they move out to move somewhere else and move back in uh, after the mining is, uh, has finished? Um, 
because all that information, well, it seems like, oh yeah, you should know that. That isn't actually known yet about, uh, about Arctic grayling. And our project partners currently are um, uh, NND, First Nation. Um, also, I forgot to put it on there, the DFO um, and uh, a couple other departments in the, the Yukon government uh, will be um, partnering with us. We started this maybe two years ago um, with limited success uh, due to a mix of um, COVID the first year and then really, really, really high water the second year. Uh, so what does plaster mining sort of look like as far as grayling are concerned? Um, this is a picture from that dairy. You can see that there is um, sort of on the right hand side, uh, sort of more of a straightening uh, of the stream where the active mining is occurring. And then further downstream, this is a fairly long creek. Uh, I can't remember offhand, but I want to say 30, 40 kilometers um, is uh, an outflow of sediment uh, coming down because that's what lots of plaster mining is doing. Um, so you can clear, this is going into a wetland uh, system at the, at the top end of the lake, um, but you can really see sort of the right side um, of the screen is relatively clear and the left side has a lot of sediment going through. So if we went back to the start of the talk saying that new cold, clear water, this water may be really cold, but uh, not, not so clear. So the thought is that a, to find out if this amount of sediment or this sediment that may be fine in the current um, thresholds of uh, what is allowed uh, regulatory wise uh, is suitable for grayling. Does it harm them or does it actually push them out into other systems? So the system is interconnected with about two other creeks that give them different options. So we'll be looking at those creeks to see if uh, the fish from Creek 1 actually said, you know what, this is too silty, I'm going to go to Creek 2 or if they're actually impacted. So it's a mix of looking at the population, looking at the movements, and then uh, specific uh, locations uh, that we did um, some uh, more detailed actual habitat analysis that we'll be able to go back to see after. We expect that it will be um, fairly disrupted, but we wanna see what the actual difference is before, after, and then after uh, any sort of remediation. So a lot of our grayling work takes place in springtime, because that's when grayling are there the most, that's when responding, that's when we sense the various, so that's when we are out there dealing with grayling, uh, which matches up relatively well with our, our very short summer season, because we spend most of the summer going to about four or five lakes uh, to assess for lake trout populations in sort of late June uh, through August. And then we do some other work with it, whether it's either burbage or something else in, in the fall. So it's a, it's a short time window. Um, luckily, we only have a few species, but it's, it's still, uh, this is what we spend our time doing in the, in the summertime. If you want to be a fisheries biologist, uh, it is a great profession. Uh, so any questions in the comments, uh, by all means, shoot an email to this. Um, our team is pretty small. Uh, I do check this on a relatively regular basis, uh, so we will get back to you, um, but we'll see if there's any uh, questions. Thanks, Cameron. Um, that's that's super. And yeah, being a fisheries biologist is pretty amazing. Not that you're biased at all, um, but it's it's good that you found something that you're uh, you're so passionate about. And thank you so much for sharing that with us tonight. Um, the one question uh, did come up was um, if you could go back to. Sorry, now that you stopped sharing your screen, um, could you go back to the map of grayling and just read out a, a few of the jurisdictions again um it was kind of blurry and some some folks were yeah yeah no problem um let me also ben has requested uh, more fish talks so sorry your wednesday nights are going to get booked up cameron yeah no problem i think i know which ben you're talking about too <laughs> yeah <laughs> Uh, no, it's great. I, uh, the more stuff like this, the better, right? Like we see yeah. a lot of, um, well, hunting is obviously quite popular, but so is fishing and more fishing out there. And information we get out there, the better. So I believe this is the map you're talking about. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I'll go sort of west to east, north to south uh, on the status, which is, I'm assuming is the, some of the questions. So Alaska, 
they're saying grayling is secure in uh, Light blue, so BC, Yukon, Northwest Territories is saying it's apparently secure. Um, and from knowing those jurisdictions and the research done in that, they're essentially in the same boat as us being apparently secure. There's been um, some research done, but like the Yukon, massive areas um, where you don't have research on everything. Uh, but what we do have is saying that it's apparently secure. Nunavut uh, is vulnerable. Uh, now the range in Nunavut, there isn't as much habitat um, or spots for grayling in Nunavut as there are in uh, Alaska and, and the Yukon for sure. Uh, we go to Alberta. It uh, is imperiled. Now, Alberta's the range is mostly sort of in the north, although it can be found uh, throughout. But the more south you go, like when you start hitting Montana, you're really into that sort of the southern range of graylings. You're not going to find a lot when they were doing well without humans, let alone when, when humans are here, because that's just their, their maximum, because you're getting into warmer temperatures um, and different food sources and different predators, uh, mostly temperature based. Uh, so they're imperiled. There's clearly lots of um, industrial activity in, in Alberta. Um, and I believe they, I'm not sure if they've listed them and their species at risk, um, but I know there is, um, if you go to Alberta's website, there's a lot of information grayling in their status. Saskatchewan and Manitoba, they say they're doing pretty good. Um, not sure exactly on the research that is being done uh, in those jurisdictions. And then Montana is critically imperiled um, with some exotic. Um, I don't know if they're really transplanted though. I think this is more of their natural range in sort of these lower US states and then Ontario with, uh, with Michigan saying that they used to be there and now they're extinct. And you can find some good information pretty easily um, online on their website available, but there, there is a program going on in Michigan right now to reintroduce grayling. And it is a mix of looking at habitat, but they're also uh, stocking grayling. Uh, I can't remember where they're actually getting the grayling from. Uh, and there's a question, we don't stock uh, grayling uh, across the Yukon. In the freshwater stocking program, it is, it is Arctic uh, char, rainbow trout and kokanee uh, salmon. Those are the only three fish species that are, are stocked uh, in the Yukon. We don't stock um, grayling. We don't stock lake trout, even in, in lakes that are um, recovering because we want to try to keep that genetic, um, natural Yukon genetic, what's the word I'm looking for? Coolness of whatever. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure the word is coolness of whatever lake. Yeah, is. that's the technical term. Yeah. That, that so, sorry, I'm a Yukon lake cool trout is are more cool than others. So, we'll so population that, that we think, yeah, that we think could be recovered too. Um, we're trying to do it more naturally um, so far, um, but stocking has been used across across mm -hmm. the states for sure. All so right. hopefully that answered that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, there weren't uh, there weren't too many other questions. Just one about wondering if you can do genetic population surveys using eDNA. And um, Ben Ben jumped in, was able to answer that that that's usually used uh, for presence and absence studies. Is is um, correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. So eDNA. If people don't um, aren't familiar with eDNA, you're taking a water sample. And you're then taking that water sample to uh, through a filter, uh, a really really fine filter that is on really essentially a piece of looks like a piece of paper, and then you're taking that to a laboratory that we don't have here in the Yukon that analyzes it, and they can actually determine um, depending on what you're looking for, uh, what fish species are in there. Um, it is a fairly new technology um, where. Essentially, they would put in their system, this is what Arctic grayling are, does it match up with that? It doesn't just pump out a list of every single fish species. They have right. to have the, the information on what you're looking for. Um, there is some eDNA work done in, uh, across the Yukon, uh, mostly for actually bull trout is, is one, is a recent one that we're involved with. Uh, not for grayling, because it does just give presence and absence, and it's currently just tells you whether they're there or not. So hopefully in the future, it would give more of a population thing, but uh, right. Um, 
also hopefully not because it'd be really easy to do fisheries management if you just had to take a water, <laughs> water sample <laughs> suddenly your job but, got less cool <laughs> you're yeah. a water technician <laughs> but it's um it's a really neat uh, new program but yeah ben was 100 right there it's just yeah. yes or no perfect well that's that's uh that's really interesting to know about um as well um, but so yeah, that seems about the end of the questions, but if folks um, are watching this later and you have questions you'd like to ask, then you can shoot that fisheries at yukon.ca and email and Cameron will check that periodically and, and um, get back to you as soon as he can. Um, but so thank you so much for your time this evening. Um, I learned a lot about, about grayling and the work that we're doing here and uh, we'll look for some, maybe there's some places we can view some grayling in the spring uh, and perhaps we can do a walk together. Yeah, and since there's people still watching, um, if there is another fish species that you're interested in the chat to, uh, or talk about, let us know. There was a there were a couple of votes for burbot that oh, okay. people want to know about. So maybe that'll be next on the cards. Sure. All right. Like we have the most information on lecture, but yeah, we can uh, do a talk on burbot as well. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks very much. Good night, Great. everyone. Thanks,